welcome to the hangover sessions. <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> Brought to you by George Getschow. <laughs> Sponsor of... <laughs> um, hello. If you'll allow me just to, uh, to read something right quick. <clears throat> For two days, they threaded down the mountains toward the alluvial plains and the sea beyond. Their boots clomped on the frozen road beside the murmuring trucks. Along the way, at certain switchbacks, the enemy still presented himself. An ambush here, sniper fire there, but the Chinese, it seemed, had largely given up. These Americans were coming out, and nothing could halt them now. An Associated Press reporter flying over the procession found it strangely beautiful. Seen from the air, he said, the march held both significance, uh, I'm sorry, held both magnificence and pathos. There was a biblical pageantry about it. The men limped on makeshift splints and canes. Their arms dangled in slings. Their bloody clothing was tattered and ripped by shrapnel. Many had draped themselves in cowls of parachute silk. They were gaunt and greasy and chewed up. They had scales on their flesh. They were hairy, soot-smudged wretches, and they stank like herds of wildebeest. But they were proud. As they marched toward the sea, a peculiar mood settled over the ranks. It was not sadness nor triumph nor relief, though all these emotions were present. The overriding feeling might more accurately be described as insolence a kind of contempt for the whole wide world. They had seen things, they'd been part of something that they sensed would live forever. They had lost their innocence on a battlefield that had forced them to locate strengths they didn't know they had. It was a cliche often uttered by participants in great battles, but it was true. They formed their own brotherhood now. The frozen chosen, they started to call themselves. The chosen few. This fraternal spirit welled up in the form of a war chant that rippled down the line of men. Bless them all, bless them all, the commies, the UN, and all. Them red soldiers hit Hagarai and now know the meaning of the USMC. So we're saying goodbye to them all. As home through the mountains we crawl, the snow is ass deep to a man in a Jeep, but who's got a Jeep? Bless them all. Hampton Sides, ladies and gentlemen. How, how, do you, um, how do you get a scene like that? How, how, do you, uh, how do you report that out? Where does that come from? Uh, you make it up. I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is a, kind of the hangover session, I'm afraid, uh, thanks to George. Uh, and I got a big sombrero on right now. So I will try to remember uh, how I put that together. I mean, you know. You do, you do it the way you do all uh, pieces of, of narrative writing. You, you, you interview as many people as you can who were there. You look at the photos. Uh, you go to the, that mountain range if you can. I couldn't get into North Korea, but I went into the same mountains in South Korea just, just across the line. You triangulate. You look at topo maps. You, know, you, you look at f a moving footage if there is some, which there was in this case. And uh, you, know, you just begin to piece it together. Um, there was something kind of biblical about that march out of there. And uh, there's something, or, or let's say classical, almost like something out of Thucydides or Herodotus or, you know, one of these uh, classical descriptions of, of, of an ancient battle. Uh, and I wanted to uh, capture some sense of that in, in that passage. How do you, how do you find, uh, how do you find your stories? You know, I think for most of the times that I've, most of, for most of my books, it, it always starts with something personal. Uh, you meet a veteran, in this case, in the, the book about uh, the Chosen Reservoir, I, I met a veteran at a book signing, and I was signing, signing a book uh, they had written about 20 years ago called Ghost Soldiers, and uh, this guy came up to me, and he was this gruff, tough old Marine, and he said, you know, you should write about the, you should write about the, you know, the reservoir. And uh, he put this card down on my table where I was signing, and it said, The Chosen Few, uh, which you were reading about. And I noticed he was missing uh, several fingertips, which 
he said had uh, he had uh, uh, lost because of a frostbite because this battle was fought in 25 below zero weather, and um, you know something about what he said grabbed me and uh, I fouled it away. I didn't write about it immediately, but I started reading about this battle. I also recognized that the Korean War uh, is you know is an under recognized war, I think. It's, it's often been called the Forgotten War. Um, people don't quite know where to put it. Is it an extension of World War II? Was it a precursor to Vietnam? Um, and I just thought it was time to write about these guys. Uh, they are forgotten. They are the guys that we're really saying goodbye to right now in our, in our culture. I mean, these are the guys that are taking bows. These are the guys that are unfortunately dying. And um, so, um, so that's how that one came about. But it usually begins, like you say, with something personal. Uh, I think we're often taught that the best stories are, you know, they, in, in terms of historical stories, they, they happen in New York, they happen in Tokyo, they happen in London. But often the best stories that you find actually are just right under your nose, right where you live, uh, somebody that you meet. Uh, and we often uh, overlook that, I think. How, so what elements, because that must happen a lot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, somebody drops a card on your table at a signing or you stumble across an interesting nugget um, during research. Um, what elements need to be in place in order for you to sink your teeth into something and consider the, the potential of that thing uh, as maybe a book someday? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, you know the, the, the whole idea of doing a book it's such a complicated endeavor. You know it's going to be with you for your whole life, uh, not just the research and the writing, but the talking about it. And, and in a sense, you, you're never, you know, this is a marriage, basically. So like all marriages, it needs to have both the kind of the rational side and the irrational side. And I always think of it as being like two ledgers. The, the rational ledger is, does this story have all these qualities that any good story needs to have? You know, good characters, uh, good primary documents, good beginning, middle, and end. Has it been written about too much or maybe not enough? Uh, and so you kind of go down this checklist and check off all those things. But then the other side of the ledger um, is completely irrational. You know, it's just a feeling. It's, it's like you're falling in love. And uh, you, you have to have that kind of hair sticking up on the back of your neck feeling uh, at some point early on uh, or the, the things, you're not, never going to, that's sort of the fuel that keeps you going, I think. That hunch, that feeling kind of almost like butterflies in your stomach. Like, this is a great story. I really want to, I want to tell this story. I want to rescue this from the recesses of history. And um, so you need to have both, you know, just like uh, when you uh, fall in love. You know, she, uh, you know she's, she's wonderful, she's smart, and she's terrific. She's a great cook. Uh, but more importantly, I love her, you know, because you're going to be stuck with this um, book for the rest of your life. And you need to have that, that wonderful, deep feeling of, you know, of, of this, you know, this is something that, um, that you, can't even, you can't even articulate it sometimes, why, why it's a story that you have to tell. But you need to, you need to feel that feeling. So sticking with this uh, theme of love and marriage to a story, have you ever gotten engaged and then regretted it? <laughs> yeah, many times, many, many, many times. And, uh, you know, usually I've been able to back, back my way out of it. Uh, and I've had a lot of, you know, interesting things happen along the way. For example, I had signed a book contract and found out that uh, within about a month of my signing it, this was going to be a book about the largest sea battle in the history of the world, the Battle of Leyte Gulf in the Philippines. And then I found out uh, that another guy who I had actually met here at the Mayborn, um, Jim Hornfisher, was, was writing Horn the Fisher. exact same book. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I had to back off. You know, it was like there were, uh, weren't going to be two books at the same time about the same battle and even the same ship in that battle. I had the same thing happen a second time uh, where I had my book In the Kingdom of Ice, a story about an obscure American attempt on the North Pole in the, in the Gilded Age. And a couple of months into it, I found out that another guy was writing the exact same book. Uh, and uh, we had our sort of little standoff. And in this case, he backed off, thank God. So uh, it, it happens all the time. With nonfiction, you're always looking over your shoulder 
You're always worried and wondering whether someone else is chipping away at the same exact book. And it's just one of the, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of the cost of doing business in this profession, right? Because it's, it's public domain, whether you're writing about contemporary events or historical events. Um, and sometimes there's room for more than one book about the same exact subject, but, uh, but uh, it, it does happen surprisingly often. Do you um, keep these things close to uh, close to the vest, um, or do you talk about them in advance? I noticed uh, in the in the Mayborn Q and A that you weren't afraid to share that you're working on a book about James Cook. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a little superstitious about talking about current projects. Uh, the first writer that I ever met growing up in Memphis uh, was uh, the Civil War historian Shelby Foote. And uh, he, we did an interview for Memphis Magazine many, many years ago uh, in which he gave me this great piece of advice. He said that, that writing is like cooking beans in a pressure cooker. And uh, I think I may talk about that in the story, in the story in the Mayborn Magazine. But he said, you know, essentially that you know, it's so hard to write, and good writing happens under pressure. As soon as you start letting off that pressure, uh, bit by bit by bit, talking about your project at cocktail parties and dinner parties and how you're going to do this and how you're going to do that, you know, it just dissipates that energy, that steam, and the beans never get cooked. Uh, so I'm, that, that's one of the reasons I'm superstitious about talking about projects. The other is... Uh, you know, I don't necessarily want to, I kind of don't want to open up the kimono too much uh, because you might find out that someone else decides to write the same book. Um, but, um, so it's a tricky thing, you know. But sometimes you do have to talk about a particular problem that you're having when you're deep into a project. You need to, you need to uh, compare notes with somebody who's been that, down that road before. Um, and, you know, certainly those kinds of conversations are, are, are always helpful when you're maybe wrestling with it something about structure, you can't figure out how to, you know, deal with a particular character. Um, those kind of conversations are, are wonderful to have with, with, especially with other writers and editors um, who, who, who make this their lifeblood. So uh, forgive the very fundamental question, but can you tell us about the pitch process? Who, you, you personally settle on an idea, who do you tell? How do you tell it? Uh, and then take us through what your proposal looks like. Well, I mean, I've been doing this a while now, so my proposals get, are getting shorter and shorter. Uh, they're like memos to my editor, but he still rejects them. Um, and, you know, he feels free to say this is a stupid idea. And um, I, uh, my, I had really wanted to write a book about Apollo 11. And... Um, Jim Donovan is here. He's got a book out, just, just come, out, come out about Apollo 11. But my editor said that was stupid. That was a stupid thing to write about. Um, he said uh, he didn't like my proposal. Uh, he said all it is is a, a guys in a tin can flipping switches. <clears throat> you know, it's arguably true. the greatest event in human history in terms of engineering and a, a lot of other things. But that's what he thought it would be. And... Um, I, somehow he talked me off the ledge, and I kind of regret it sometimes. Uh, although um, then I would have been competing with Jim Donovan and others who've. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the pitch process. I mean, part of it was my proposal wasn't very good. Uh, I just said I want to write about Apollo 11. You know, that's pretty much my pitch. And uh, wait, that was your pitch? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, no. Know. I mean, it was a little longer than that. It was a paragraph. And what did it say? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, no, I, I honestly I, don't remember. But one of the things he did say is that you write best when you write about landscape and uh, uh, people moving over land, uh, marches, uh, 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 treks, uh, uh, road trips, um, manhunts, you know, and and uh, this is a, such a different story. You're not going to really be able to write about landscape. I mean, I suppose you can describe the moon, but um, I, I took that to heart, and I went back and looked at my books again because I'm always wondering what, what unifies all these books that I've now written. I, what's the common thread? And one of the common threads is definitely landscape. I try to make landscape a character. I try to, you know, the sense of place. Uh, I, put, I invest a lot of energy and time uh, in that, and, I, and in that sense, I think he was right. The, the, yeah, the common thread is probably that 
almost every book, I think maybe besides the, the MLK book, uh, the subtitle could be, you know, the epic story of people who find themselves in a terrible situation and figure out how to get out of it, right? Yeah. Um, do you ever worry that that, I mean, this is successful for you, do you ever want to like throw a curveball? Um, yeah, you know. I don't like write about tulips or, or something <laughs> right, like that. Right, right. Uh, my, my books do seem to have this common theme of, of sort of men in extreme situations and, and sort of how, how they got in that situation. Uh, it does seem to be mostly men, um, although I'm, you know, that's just sort of the way it's worked out so far. Um, but then also, how do they get out of that situation? What combination of traits, uh, strengths, are they able to find within themselves uh, to survive? Uh, I guess survival is, is, is certainly a theme that I write about a lot, and it probably emerges partly from the fact that I was an editor at Outside Magazine for, for years where we write all these sort of two-fisted He-Man adventure stories about mountain climbers and, you know, all, all, you know, themes like cannibalism and, you know, all sorts of fun, fun themes like that. But, uh, and, and uh, you know, suffering in all sorts of situations. Um, I, I, it is, a, it is a, a, um, a theme that I keep returning to, and, and it's, it's endlessly interesting. And, and I suppose the other side of the equation is, you know, if, if people go on a trip and everything goes perfectly and everybody succeeds and everyone's happy and then they get home and, you know, where's the story? You know, things have to go wrong. There has to be some sort of conflict. There has to be some sort of catastrophe, uh, I think, for it to be interesting on the page. Uh, when everything goes, you know, when everything clicks and it's perfect, um, it, it's often quite dull for, for the reader. And maybe that's another reason why my editor didn't want me to write about Apollo 11. And the, 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 things went well, you know, from beginning to end. I, I know there were some close calls, but uh, I guess I tend to write about sort of tragic uh, social disasters. These are man-made disasters, almost every one. They're not uh, natural disasters. Uh, and then how these folks get out of these situations. Um, so your proposals are getting shorter uh, because you've got a name. Uh, you've done this successfully quite a, quite a few times now. Um, how uh, how do they look different today versus when you you know your very first proposal? My first proposal was for this book, Ghost Soldiers, uh, and it was you know a seventy page document. Yeah. You know it, it had a lot of you know here's how I'm going to write it. Here's going to be the structure. Here's some samples of my writing. I wrote a sample chapter. Uh, my agent put me through my paces, and uh, it was time well spent because the book ended up almost exactly the way I envisioned it in the proposal. And uh, uh, those of you who are first-time writers, uh, that's still something I highly recommend. You know, when you're trying to sell a book, you, you need to put heart and soul in your proposal and have a good agent who, who walks you through those steps and, and gets, it to, gets it to market that way because it's... Uh, you know, even though, you know, you're going to get into the story and you're going to decide that many parts of your proposal maybe are, are wrong uh, or you just want to take it in a different direction, at least having that foundation um, is, you know, it's just time well spent and, and uh, I, you know, highly recommend it. Um, do you do a lot of thinking about who your audience might be? Um, or who do you write for? Yeah, who's well, your audience? My uh, I, somebody at my publisher Doubleday told me one day exactly who my audience apparently is, and it's uh, women uh, who are over seventy-five uh, who um, are buying masculine-sounding books for their husbands and for other men in their family for Father's Day, birthday, or Christmas. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's exactly my my demographic apparently, and uh, I love it. You know, I love my audience. No, my readers. You you love your readers, however they come. M many of them, you can hear them coming before you you know see them. And uh, um, I it, it it does it is a source of profound uh, disappointment that more younger people don't read books in general, but history in particular. Um, but it, it is true. That that seems to be my. My audience and these women. By the way, I mean women buy so much more uh, books than men, both for themselves to read, but also for the 
for the men and their family. Um, but uh, a lot of times these women buy, buy the book for their husbands. The husbands don't read the book, but they do. The women do. So uh, it's interesting, the, the dynamics of it all. So do you keep Ethel in your head uh, <laughs> Ethel. while you're writing? I, no, I try not. I mean, yeah, I think when, you know, the whole question of who you're thinking about when you write, who is your audience, is, is almost an existential question. You know, like, I don't, sometimes I think I'm just talking to myself, audience of one being me, but then I, that, you know, that, that sort of sounds like a crazy person uh, talking to himself. Uh, so then I think, well, maybe a better analogy is you're sitting in a bar or a coffee shop talking to one person. You know, just telling a story over a cup of coffee. And uh, that feels like a better, uh, a better analogy. Yeah. Um, uh, otherwise, you're just kind of muttering to yourself. And, uh, you know, but, but, you know, I have read one of my books, uh, Hellhound on His Trail. I, I did read that in a studio for the audio version of the book. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You're listening to your own voice. You hate your own voice. And I always I also would be reading this stuff in the studio and saying, like, who the hell wrote this? Uh, I, I'm wanting to edit, edit myself. And contractually, you're not allowed to do that. Um, it has to, you have to read exactly what it, it says on the page. And this guy, the producer there, he, he said, you know, this, you're going to find this is really hard, uh, reading this book. Um, and he said, it's going to be like digging a six-foot hole in the ground with your face. Because, you know, your, your lips, your tongue, your throat, unless you're a Broadway singer, you know, it's, it's just, you don't have the pipes for it. And after seven straight days of reading, eight, nine, ten hours a day, you're exhausted. Um, so uh, hats off to those guys who do, uh, do read, you know, the professional readers. I re highly re recommend going with the professional reader. Yeah, how did that, how, how did that happen that, that, that you read Hellhound? Well, they asked me, uh, you know, that's one book that, you know, it's, it's about my hometown of Memphis. It's, uh, it's about the, the, the seismic event and, and the, probably the most important event in, in our town's history, the, the MLK assassination. And uh, when they asked me, if did I want to read, I thought, well, this is a personal story, m much more than some of my other books. And I said, I'll give it a try. Uh, I've, you know, I've done some radio journalism. I, I've done voiceovers. Um, you know, I'll give it a try. But I, I kind of regretted it about two or three days into it. I said, man, this is hard. This is really hard. So you, you don't necessarily uh, uh, read your work out loud as a part of the editing process? Then? Well, I do. Um, my, my wife, Anne, is a former NPR editor and, and, and producer. And, um, uh, you know, I, I always like her to, to read my stuff. And she prefers for me to, to read it to her out loud. She mm -hmm. likes to hear it just like she would if she had been a radio uh, back in a radio uh, studio, and but she's real busy doing stuff. So I ended up. It's pathetic. I, you know, I'm just shambling around the house, following her as she goes about her errands or whatever, <laughs> reading like a neurotic, needy, you know, soul. Uh, some paragraph that I'm having trouble with, and wearing a uh, kimono. Yeah, yeah. Opening up the kimono. Um, no, she's. She, yeah, she's wearing the kimono. Oh, she is. Uh, what does she look like? Uh, <laughs> I just want to picture. Her. Uh, <laughs> beautiful, of course. Um, but no, it, it, it is weird. Uh, I do think writing should be read out loud. I, I do think it is, uh, you know, it's meant to be, you know, not just a cerebral or a visual thing, but, but it's, it's a, there's a music to it, and, and the rhythms need to be right. And um, if you can't read it out loud at least one time, uh, there's something, you know, there's something wrong with that passage. You know, it needs to be, uh, it needs to have a sound, you know, and, and not just a... Um, a, a visual element. Yeah. Do you, uh, <clears throat> before I ask that question, so what percentage of the overall research and reporting have you done at the, at the, when you pitch? Mm -hmm. Can you say? Well, oh, when I pitch, probably very little, very, very little, but um, maybe a, an even bigger question and how I've evolved uh, is that I used to think, um, and probably everybody in this room has wrestled with this, but I used to think you couldn't write a single word until you had done all your research. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a formula for never writing a book <laughs> because you can never do all your research. Um, there has to come a point where you stop the endless procrastination, as someone put it, 
uh, I think it was Margo, the, you know, like it, uh, research can be a form of procrastination, and it, it certainly uh, was with my first book. Uh, and what I realized is you can start right, you know, you can, you can write a first draft of a chapter and fill in the blanks later. Um, and so my, my writing now is filled with a lot more holes and TKs and, you know, stuff that I'll come back to. And it's fine. It's fine. Uh, and at least the book gets written that way. Um, otherwise, you know, I, this book that I'm writing now, which is about Captain Cook's third and final voyage, uh, there's just so much research to be done. He went to something like 40 countries just in that one voyage. Um, well, I could just research that the rest of my life and never write the book. So um, it's important to start writing as early as you, as you can and get something down on the page. That's not how you used to do it, so that's come about lately? Yeah, I used to just really try to write until basically till the editor says you have to stop this research stuff. You just got to start writing. And I don't think that's particularly healthy. Uh, and it'll, it'll drive you crazy. How do you know when you're done researching and reporting? When you're out of money, uh, <laughs> when, when, when your relationships with your loved ones is, starts to really deteriorate, um, when your editor stop, you know, is just really mad at you all the time, um, <laughs> those, are some of the, those are some of the ways. Uh, but obviously, you know, you, I've done enough magazine journalism uh, to know, you know, I've fleshed out a story, and I've got a lot of details, I've got, I've got plenty to work with. You know, you should have an intuitive feel for, for like, you know, I've done my work. I've done most of the work. Uh, and, I, and if I hadn't, it'll show up in the draft. You'll see where the holes are. Yeah. And then you'll go back and re-report those places that are missing. Have you uh, hit spots where um, the material uh, doesn't hold up, uh, doesn't deliver, and you realize having already pitched a book, sold a book, you realize that there are shortcomings in character development or, uh, you know, or in plot that just don't exist in the, in the, in the record. Well, yeah, a good example of that was, is my book Blood and Thunder, which is largely about the life and times of this very controversial frontiersman, Kit Carson. And um, one of the problems with Kit Carson was um, he was illiterate. And uh, so he didn't write anything down. So how are you going to get into the life of this guy? It's really hard to write about someone who didn't, didn't, didn't compose anything. Um, I did learn early on in the project that, that the Santa Fe, the New Mexico archives had the Kit Carson papers. And so I was pretty excited about that. I uh, thought, well, maybe he did write something down. And so I went and they rolled out the box and I put on the gloves and opened up the box, and then sure enough, they, they had the Kit Carson papers, both of them. Uh, <laughs> one was his death certificate. Um, so, so, but because I live in Santa Fe, which is the new age capital of the world, um, we decided to b base that book on seances uh, with Kit Carson himself. So we got direct communication that way. Um, <laughs> but it, it is really seriously a problem when you have, uh, you know, you. Many times you just come up against a documentary and, you know, gap. There's just nothing there. In Carson's case, luckily, he was written about a lot. Uh, journalists cover him, covered him. Historians covered him. He wrote, he dictated a, an autobiography. Uh, you know, you find other sources. You find, you worm your way into the story some other way. But absolutely, it happens all the time where you just come up against a wall. There's a gap there. There's something missing. And it's, it's, very, it's very frustrating. Are you ever tempted to make shit up? <laughs> make shit up. No, I mean, you know, that's the golden rule of, of, of narrative nonfiction. It, it is not historical fiction. Uh, it, historical fiction is a couple of clicks over here on the dial. Um, you're trying to make a work feel at times like a novel or perhaps feel like a screenplay. You want to be cinematic. You want it to move. You wanted to have some of the attributes that are more commonly associated, perhaps, with a good, a good fat literary novel, but you, you don't make you don't make shit up. That's the golden rule, and and uh, it has to come from somewhere. And uh, I, I wince every time. You know, sometimes people will describe my book as a novel. They'll say, "I loved your novel," and I, I think they mean that as a compliment. I hope they do, uh, but it's not a novel. 
You know, every fact is hard won. It comes from an archive. It comes from it, it comes from an interview. It, it comes from an uh, after-action report or, uh, you know, whatever. And you spend so much time. I think I spend probably three-quarters of my time on the research, you know, getting those facts. Uh, and only one quarter of it actually writing. So, so I wince when people say, well, you know, love that novel of yours. Um, so, you know, no, you can't, you can't make anything up. That's, that's sort of the golden rule. That's, I think that's why we're here in this room is because we care about getting the facts right. And we live in a time of, it's been called of truth, you know, truth decay. You know, this, this idea that, you know, there are no actual facts anymore. There's only like Fox facts and CN facts, CNN facts and MSNBC facts. And, you know, we all kind of retreat into our little echo chambers and believe what we want to believe. And I think everyone in this room, on the contrary, believes that we're here, you know, I, you know, believes that there, there are identifiable object, objective facts and, um, and uh, it's worth pursuing them and d dedicating your whole life to pursuing them. Yeah. I sort of, uh, sometimes I think that's owed to reader ignorance, honestly. Um, uh, but you address this, I've seen you address this in a foreword, um, if I'm not mistaken. You say nothing in this book is made up. I've mm -hmm. seen Eric Larson do the same yeah. thing and others. Um, uh, so, uh, have you ever been wrong? No. Because <laughs> your, your books are, uh, what, 90,000 words, 100,000 uh, words? There's yeah, a lot of I've, words to get right. I've absolutely, you know, uh, been wrong, and, and, you know, I, I always encourage people, particularly, you know, when you're writing about a, a battle and the participants of the battle who were there on the ground, you know, I want to know what they think, and I want to know if there's anything wrong. And, by the way, one thing I have found out is that you can make any mistake, any kind of factual error you can think of, and you, and you will be forgiven, except if it has to do with ballistics. Yeah. Uh, the gun people come out of the woodwork, yeah. and, you know, yeah, like... If you say it was automatic and it was semi-automatic, uh, they will say, well, we can't, we can't trust anything this author has to say. Uh, he's obviously a liar. And uh, I, I've, I've made some ballistic errors. The other category like that is nautical. Uh, any kind of nautical error, oh, my God. Uh, you call it a sprit, and it's a spar. You know, and we can't trust anything this author has to say. Uh, so, obviously, factual errors of that sort and uh, are, you want to weed those out. And one of the ways you weed them out is send it out to those experts to read in, dra in a manuscript form um, and fact check the heck out of it and, and do your best. But sometimes errors are there and you just try to correct them in all future editions, which we've done. And, um, you know, I don't mean to say there's a lot of errors, but there, there are some minor ones in the new book that we've caught that will be corrected in the paperback version. So gotcha. you just do, you, you do the best you can. Do you outline? Outline. Um, I, I do. I, I really believe in outlines, and not like the Roman numeral sort of outline, uh, but, you know, just kind of a road map of your book. This is where you think it's going to go. Um, it's just like going on a road trip. You want a general idea of where you're going to go, but you also want to leave, leave room for detours and leave room for the unexpected. And, but just having that road map, that little bit of a blueprint, gives you a certain security, gives you a sense of structure, a sense of discipline, um, and absolutely, I believe, yeah, I think it's, I believe in outlines, but I equally believe in the necessity of abandoning your outline uh, if, if, you're, you know, if your book um, wants to go in another direction and if your editor is willing to let you go in that direction. Uh, Blood and Thunder was going to be a book about the... Um, the Navajo Wars, at the very, you know, the, the very end of Kit Carson's life, he, he led this campaign to, um, to round up the Navajo and uh, move them to kind of a concentration camp uh, in eastern New, New Mexico. And that was going to be my book. Uh, but then I got interested in Kit Carson, and um, the book began to expand backwards in time and, and all over the country because I was following this guy, Kit Carson. And so in the end, um, 
the Navajo War is the last three chapters, I believe, of a, of a 40 some odd chapter book. So that's how much that book changed from outline form wow. to the final, final thing. So sometimes you gotta be really open to, to let a book evolve and breathe and change direction uh, and not be scared to kind of let, let it do that. So do you typically have an ending in mind when you start writing? I mean, do you know the arc in, in full? I, I, d I prefer to have an ending in mind. I think you know, some writers, even novelists, will say they, know, they don't know anything except the ending. You know? yeah. And then they write towards an ending. Uh, in, in nonfiction, it's a little easier to know the ending because you know, you, you know, you know how the story ends. Um, by reading the documents, but, but, and you need to have, I think, the clarity of knowing that, you know, what the beginning, middle, and end of a story is, what is the, where, where are the brackets of a story, is, is very important to have bef before you start writing. Um, there may be a lot of detours along the way that you didn't anticipate, but, uh, you know, the story ends here, and, and most of my stories have that kind of already built in, like, in the Kingdom of Ice is about an expedition. They went out into the world, they went into the Arctic, some came home, and obviously it ends with their return. Um, other stories, it's a little murkier. How are you going to end the thing? Yeah. Um, uh, how do you? Uh, 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 what, what are the what are the parameters of uh, success for you? How how do, how do you judge your your own your own work? How do you know a book is a success <laughs> in your head? Well, uh, is it sales? Is it is it? Critical review, is it? Yeah, I mean, it, there's a, I guess my thinking on that has evolved. Um, my most successful book was my first book, Ghost Soldiers. And, you know, it's like, I didn't see it coming. And, you know, it's sold, you know, over a million copies. It's been translated in like 20 languages. And it was turned into a movie, not a very good movie, uh, by a guy named Harvey Weinstein, great guy. Um, <laughs> Miramax, uh, and you know, I had all this quote unquote success uh, that put me on the map both kind of fun and financially it did well and uh, I bought a house, you know, I so suddenly wasn't a struggling writer anymore. But you told me last you know, night you don't have a car? Oh, I don't have a car right now, that's true. Um, but um, that's not, that, that's because uh, my wife and I share one and you know, it's, it's, it, it's by choice. It's by choice. Gotcha. Um, because I don't have one, but, other but it's books, not by choice. You know, but other... <laughs> <laughs> I just can't, can't afford one. But, you know, but other books, you know, they're successful in other ways because, you know, you feel like you really nailed the story or you made a difference or you, people, you know, some of the letters that you get from, from readers, uh, just, it just rocks your world. And uh, so you, you got to look ultimately at your body of work. You know, just like when I... When I when I croak, you know, I want to be able to sort of look back and say, you know, there, I had a body of work and it was hopefully greater than the sum of its parts and it sort of covered a lot of ground and, and the, the standards were high and I did, I did my best with each project and, and that's really all you can hope for in the end. I'll open it to questions. I know we're a tad early, but Farley? Thank you very much. Um, I listened to the audiobook of Hellhound, and you do a lot of things very, very well. Uh, so don't be self-conscious about that effort. Um, I have a two-part question for you about that book. Uh, did you begin it with a reasonable expectation that you might establish or understand not so much Ray's motivations for what he did, but more about how the plot to assassinate King came about? And so many authors of crime stories and Justice stories make a lot, get a lot of hay out of trials. And I was struck that you didn't cover the trial of Ray, and I was curious why. Okay, uh, yeah, so Hell, Hell, and I's Trail is, you know, it's about the MLK assassination, and uh, I, I started that book out with a very different idea. This is one that changed dr dramatically from my outline. Because what I wanted to do originally was I wanted to write a biography of my hometown. Uh, set against the backdrop of the assassination, but I really wanted to write about the Civil War and Nathan Bedford Forrest and uh, Ida Wells and um, 
race relations in, uh, along the racial fault line of, of the Delta and cotton and barbecue and Elvis and, you know, Memphis is a very interesting place, and there's a lot of stories to try to get your arms around, and that's how that book started out. Um, so, so uh, I'm sorry to mm-hmm. interrupt you, but so the pitch was a, a, a profile of a place? It was going to be something like, yeah, a biography of Memphis set against the backdrop of, of, of the King assassination and the garbage, you know, the sanitation strike and the... Um, uh, but then, the, you know, the story began to coalesce more and more. It was obviously a very diffuse idea, and uh, I couldn't make it really work. I was kind of imagining something like Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil or, you know, some kind of place-based book. Um, but what, what began to also happen is I, I started out the project assuming that there was this massive conspiracy and that James Earl Ray was innocent, that he was a patsy, that he that he had been framed in some way, because this is what I heard, what I imbibed growing up in Memphis uh, all my life. And, but then I began to look at, into the real evidence against Ray, and because studied his movements, his, what he was reading, what he was thinking, and, and he kind of hijacked the book, because I became convinced, utterly convinced, that he did it. And, uh, then I began to think, well, this, is a, this story is going to evolve into something very different. It, it really is a story of three different chases. It's a story of, of J. Edgar Hoover and sort of history and fate chasing Martin Luther King in his last year. Um, his awareness that his time was short on this earth and, and uh, what was happening to the movement in those last months. And then the second chase was James Earl Ray chasing literally in the last month, stalking um, MLK. And then the third chase is J. Edgar Hoover and his FBI, most unlikely entity to to be doing this, chasing James Earl Ray uh, on this manhunt that lasted for more than two months. 6,000 agents were involved. Many millions of dollars were spent. They finally captured him in London. Uh, And uh, so... The story, again, the story evolved dramatically from the outline and from what the original, propos- what the original proposal was. Um, I didn't write about the trial because there wasn't a trial. Uh, he pled guilty, and many people forget this. Uh, James Earl Ray pled guilty, uh, and uh, the evidence against him was voluminous, staggering amount of stuff down into the level of receipts and fibers and fingerprints and, you know, he bought the gun, he bought the scope, he bought the ammunition, he bought the binoculars, he checked into that rooming house, he admitted to all of this stuff. Um, but the fact that there wasn't a trial is, is a real shame because uh, it, it's, it's fueled a lot of the conspiracy theories, understandably. You know, it's like people think all of this was swept under the rug. And if, if we had had a public trial... Uh, I think uh, a lot of these questions would have been resolved in a much more open, transparent way. And um, I do believe there was a conspiracy, actually. Um, I do believe that Ray had help. I do believe he thought at least he was going to connect with some money. Um, His brothers, who were both felons, certainly helped him. Um, So, so you know, I do go into that a little bit in the book. But that's why I didn't go into the trial, because there wasn't actually... Uh, a public trial. So do conspiracy theorists think that you're just a tool for the... Oh, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, like all my books, I think, all my, all my other books, people, I go on book tour and people come out and they either like my books or they don't like my books or they like the story or they don't. But with that book, I encountered, you know, the conspiracy community, which is out there, small but very, very vocal you can usually see them a mile away. They usually have a toupee, um, uh, and you know they, you know, you know, 9/11 didn't, you know, it was all planned, and you know, uh, you, you name the conspiracy. Uh, most of them are, are just wired that way, and uh, I've been uh, deposed by a conspiracy lawyer, a, a, a notorious guy named Dr. Pepper. Uh, he. Uh, well, anyway, I, that's a whole other story. Um, but, but, you know, they've said, they've said things like, you know, Hampton Sides is obviously uh, a pseudonym uh, concocted by the CIA. I was born from an early age, you know, groomed to 
groomed from an early age to, to write this book. Um, uh, <laughs> And all kinds of things like that that are just fun, funny and interesting to think about. But, um, you know, obviously not true. Uh, you wouldn't know if it was not true. Yeah. Right. Well, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> uh, I've got a question. Uh, in the, there's a Google review of your latest book. It's pretty neat. It says, superb, a masterpiece of thorough research, deft pacing, and arresting detail. This war story, the fight to break out of a frozen hell near the Chosin Reservoir, has been told many times before. My question is, how, since it has, how did you go about making it different? Well, uh, anytime you're going to write about a battle, um, you're going to there's going to be a lot of other accounts, and that's one of the things I think that you have to recognize uh, and get out of your system in a hurry. Uh, this 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 feeling you you have to actually kind of psych yourself up. I think to almost to write any kind of piece of work of, of, of journalism or history, you have to sort of say, I'm, you know, it's something you almost have to do every day. Like, I, I'm the guy to write this story. This is the most important story. You know, it has to be told. You have to work yourself up into a frenzy um, and not think about all those previous books. Um, the, the, there have been a lot written about the Battle of Chosen Reservoir, probably the most written about battle in the Korean War. And yet, I would go around asking people, you know, random people, not, not necessarily people on the street, but, you know, friends of mine. And, you know, it's like, have you ever heard of the Battle of Chosen Reservoir? And almost to a, to a person, the answer was no. You know, it's like, it's, perhaps it's because it, ha it happened in the Korean War, and we just, our knowledge of the Korean War, despite endless episodes of MASH, is uh, somehow limited or, you know, uh, complicated in some way. Um, and so that was, you know, Certainly one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was to kind of resuscitate uh, this war and this battle particularly uh, and the recognition that th though there, there have been many books before, uh, it's still just not on our radar screen, particularly among young people. Um, I also knew that with the passage of time, there, there, there's more stories out there to work with. There's more, more stuff has come out. Some stuff has been um, uh, declassified. Um, I also wanted to try to, to write about the North Korean perspective. There's a major character in the book who's from North Korea. Uh, I wanted to write about the Chinese perspective, which has been under, um, you know, under, underwritten about and uh, not written about at all. And uh, so, you know, there's different, different angles of attack that, that I wanted to, um, to apply. But I think it's, it's a real problem with anyone who does history is the, the recognition that, you know, there are other people who've been down this path. Uh, maybe they're working on the same book at this exact same time you are. And that's obviously very uh, nerve wracking. But thanks for your question. I yeah, like the pressure cooker uh, metaphor. How do you handle a question? You're at a social event and somebody comes up and says, so what are you writing about these days? Well, uh, like I, I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a little bit suspicious. I'm a little bit pre um, superstitious about talking too much about a book. Uh, but um, And sometimes I will say, you know, I'd just rather not talk about it. But, um, you know, I don't want to be coy about it either or precious about it. I mean, it, it, it is what it is. Um, this current book that I'm writing is about Captain Cook's um, third voyage, uh, the one in which he is killed in Hawaii and possibly eaten um, and, you know, we'll have a recipe or two in the back. Um, um, but, I mean, I, I, I suppose, I suppose, uh, and, then, you know, that's a story that's been written before in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but I, I will try to find a, a, a new way into it. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I guess the thing is I'll, I'll say what I'm writing about, but I don't want to go into details uh, because then I feel like I'm releasing the pressure. Uh, and, and, and writing only happens under enormous pressure, I think, at least for me. Okay. So it really is going to be a cookbook then, right? <laughs> Say that again? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a cookbook, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, Don't quit your day job. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's too late. Thanks. Um, <laughs> my question is, you, t you talked about audience. What about, especially your, your, your two books on Desperate Ground and Go Soldiers, 
Um, I would think a significant part of your audience are, are the survivors who went through them. Uh, how much do they come to mind when you're writing? And how much do you feel like you owe them when, you write, when you're writing their, the account of what they went through? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, these disaster stories that I've written about, I mean, that's, that's sort of what keeps me going is, is focusing on the survivors, focusing on those who got through it. And uh, it, it is the, the thing that keeps you from, you know, these are, I mean, these are dark stories. The, the Bataan Death March and those prison camps in the Philippines were, were you know, ho horrific places and wretched places. And um, so, but, we, you know, just, you know, like Beth Macy said, you know, she focuses on the helpers. Uh, uh, that's a way to get, pull yourself through a very dark story. And um, that's, I guess I view these guys in the same way, the survivors. Um, they're... In both cases, with ghost soldiers and then now with on desperate ground, I was interviewing people who are usually in their 80s, 90s, um, and I'm I'm taking notes like a journalist does, but I'm also taking kind of mental notes. Like, I want what these guys have. I, I, these guys are tough. They, these guys not only are survivors in the sense that they got through this ordeal, but they got through, you know, coming back to society and plugging back in and getting through life and. You know, get, you know, reaching a, a ripe old age, and many of them, most of them, weren't bitter. They somehow f found a way to deal with this. Uh, and and I, yes, I feel tremendous debt to them, and I feel like th these are my uncles or something uh, that I, I, they've entrusted me with this story, and I've got to, I've got to, I've got to tell it right. And um, and uh, these guys from from the Korean War book, I mean, they're spread out all over the place. Uh, the chosen few, most of them I've noticed settled in places like Florida, um, warm places, uh, but they're they're amazing guys. The chosen few, and I go to their reunions, and uh, I go to uh, when, whenever I give a talk, I ask them to stand up and speak about their experience. Um, it's a it's a really easy book to promote because I'm really promoting them. I'm promoting this experience that they lived through, and uh, there's not many of them left. Okay, I've got a question. I was going to say, and Douglas MacArthur factors into both of those books in a big way. Have you ever thought about taking him, taking him on, head on? Maybe. I think I'm done with, done with Douglas MacArthur. He, uh, he, he's. Um, it was brilliant, but you know, usually the first to admit it. Um, he, <laughs> they used to say he's, he's in love with the vertical pronoun. Um, it was all about him, you know. He's this old school narcissistic general, grandiose, and 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 uh, you know, fascinating character, fascinating character with a long career and many highs and lows in that career. But these two chapters of history that you know in these two books capture him at his lowest moment, I think, and you know where he made decisions that affected the lives of thousands of people and put people directly and I think needlessly in harm's way. And uh, so, therefore, I, I don't uh, I don't cut him much slack uh, in in either of these two books. Great, we got a couple more questions. Go, go ahead, George. Uh, okay, so um, I thought it was wonderful to hear um, <clears throat> hear you read that almost magisterial writing of landscape, this this biblical classical scene as the soldiers. The chosen few leave, you know, this battle, this battle of epic proportions. And that was beautiful. And you said that, <clears throat> you know, you did the same thing, actually, when in Blood and Thunder, the first four pages were really about land, about this place that shaped and defined and made Kit Carson. And you spent f five pages that turned the landscape into a character, and that sounds easy, and it's beautiful the way you write, but how do you go about taking in a place? How do you go about uh, the process of um, collecting a place and turning it in, you know, giving it life and turning it into this, the character that you do? I mean, the, the reading, it, it's, this was a grim place that you, that, that, the passage that Ben read about. In, Kit Carson, you know, we, we, we sense this sweeping panorama, this place where 
this man was bigger than the place, as, as, as you know, it had this gigantic um, sense of, of wilderness, and yet he was somehow bigger than that wilderness. And you did that by turning the wilderness into a character before you even introduced Kit Carson. So I'm just curious if you could talk to us about how you go about um, evoking place. How do, you, how do you turn it into a character? It sounds simple, but it's really difficult. You did that in, in The Kingdom of Ice. The ocean becomes a character. You know, the ice becomes a character. And it's, it's fascinating. Well, uh, I think Robert Caro is probably the ultimate uh, guy about, you know, who writes about sense of place and, and how sense of place informs his character, LBJ. Um, and, you know, he writes in, in his recent book about some of those kinds of tricks or, um, they're not tricks, they're you know, really just a, a lot of reading, a lot of research, physically going to the place trying to go to the place during, in the season that you're writing about. Um, you know, um, reading uh, natural history, figuring out what's growing there, what, what, what's going on underneath the soil, and ge geologically, if there's something interesting, uh, you know, understanding the history of the place. Uh, the, you know, those, you just kind of imagine every possible angle of attack and you just, you know, just go after it. And, um, uh, you know, it's always very uh, uh, frustrating to me when I'm writing about a place that I haven't been to. Uh, I just couldn't get there, or I ran out of time, I ran out of money. Uh, this whole book on Desperate Ground is about a battle in North Korea, and I didn't, I didn't get to go to North Korea. Um, I tried in various ways, but I couldn't get to this battlefield. And um, my, I noticed, you know, my wife kept saying, I should go, I should go, you should go to North Korea, you should, you should, you should go, and she seemed like just really <laughs> emphasizing that a lot, and, <laughs> and, and, and then I found out she'd like tripled the life insurance policy, and, uh, but I mean, it was very frustrating, that, you know, to write about a battle and not being able to walk it physically, um, uh, but, but in most of these other stories, like in, in the Kingdom of Ice, it ends up in this distant uh, uh, river, Delta in, in Siberia, 400 miles north of the Arctic Circle. And I got to that place, and I went to the place where they died. And uh, that was invaluable, you know, because it gives you a confidence to write about um, that landscape and the sounds and sort of what it's like to be alive and the smells, uh, you know. And, you know, one of the tricks that they tell you in, like, writing school or, you know, writing um, uh, workshops is try, if you can, to hit every sensory... Um, try to hit every sense uh, on every page. You know, it, it, not to be formulaic about it, but try. You know, like the sense of smell, the sense of touch, the sense of whatever. Hit, hit all the senses. And if you can do that with some regularity, uh, you're getting somewhere. Um, I, I would be terrified to um, go to an editor and, and, and tell my editor that a story that I'd become engaged to was cheating on me with another writer. <laughs> How does that go? <laughs> um, it was it was devastating to me. I, I was uh, I was not only engaged. I mean, I, I we had signed the contract, and I was a month into the research, and I was going to the Philippines, and you know, and uh, uh, this is the Battle of Leyte Gulf, and then and then I found out that Hornfisher was. Uh, not only had he done it, he, he, was, he had nearly finished the book. It was, he was ha easily halfway through it. And, uh, and he had chosen to focus on this same uh, small ship. Uh, so I knew that there's just no way I could do it. So it was terrible, but, you know, it's just something you have to... It's just, you know, part of the lay of the land. I, I guess I could have done it. I, sh I could have gone ahead and, and done it anyway, but um, I, I just look for another... Uh, I look for another subject, and uh, that subject became uh, Blood and Thunder, No Regrets. Uh, my biggest book, my longest book, uh, I, in some ways maybe my, my best book, uh, and, uh, you know, you just, you just have to shut that chapter and find the new chapter and, and, and keep looking for new stories. 
I'm a big believer in having a, a file of, with as many stories as possible. You know, like I, I'm, I'm like the same way, you know, with the jokes. I can't remember a good joke. I, I always say I'm going to remember that joke. But if I don't write it down, I'm not going to remember it. Same is true with stories. I just, you know, I have to write them down. I've got maybe a list of about 20 or so stories that uh, potentially could become books one day that I'm constantly filing away and, and, and thinking about and uh, moving to the top of the list or whatever. So uh, keep the faith. Uh, I'm supposed to send you out. I have the un unenviable task, I guess, of being the, l the last guy, and I'm the one who's supposed to send you out into the world and reinvigorated and, uh, and uh, with hope for, for truth and, um, and uh, you know, storytelling. And, and I, I, I do always say when I, when I teach, I, I do a fair amount of teaching at a little college in Colorado, Colorado College, it's called. Um, and I tell these students, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like, in, you know, in terms of how your stories are going to be delivered, what format they're going to be in. Uh, I don't know how you're going to get paid. That's a big question. Uh, and I don't know, um, you know, I don't know uh, what the shape of, of your journalism experience is going to look like, but um, there's always, always, always uh, a place for great storytelling. And it is uh, deep, deep in our DNA. We have to have great storytellers. They will always find a way to get these stories out. And, uh, you know, it's just really a question of, of having a passion for something uh, and, a, and, a, and the will uh, and, uh, to go out and find these stories and, and, and keep this flame alive. Um, just as I hope we're going to keep this conference alive uh, in the years to come, I know there's some talk of, of its future. Um, so I can only hope that this conference, uh, George Getchell's creation, um, will continue on for another, what is it, 15 years and, and, and beyond. So thanks for listening. Good to see you. Congrats. Hampton Sides, ladies and gentlemen.